good to see you all this morning. I hope to provide you with an answer. If you're asked, what is the gospel? How can you answer? What would, what would be your answer? The answer that you might give, I, hopefully you've got a, a terrific one that you would use. Maybe I can help you develop that a little bit this morning. If you're not exactly sure what the gospel is, what the word means, today you, I hope that you would be able to leave with an answer. The gospel of Mark, the book of Mark, opens with the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The word itself is used 73 times in the New Testament, and an exact match in Hebrew is used four times in the Old Testament. Although the first four books of the New Testament are called the Gospels, the word Gospel is actually only in Matthew and Mark. And it's not used to describe the letter itself, or the book itself, except here in Mark. But we call the first four books the Gospels. Because the definition of the word itself is good tidings. A reward for good tidings, or just simply good tidings. Tidings means news, but I I don't know. It makes more sense to me the, the use of the old word tidings. We don't typically use the word tidings too much except in cer certain songs or, or maybe near uh, the end of the year when people are talking about the birth of Jesus and we would say tidings. But the idea of tidings instead of news is that it's something that just it, it spread more. News is just news. It's just information that comes from north, east, west, and south. But tidings, tidings get shared. Tidings get given, instructed. They get pushed forward. The gospel is good pushing forward of information. And in that, tidings works. Uh, I, I, I get why that word continues to get used in the definition. But why is it used of Jesus? Jesus himself has a pretty tragic story. In Philippians chapter 2, we're told that Jesus emptied himself and was born in human form and then was murdered. And the, the main story of Jesus is really not so encouraging. A loving God came to earth. We put him to death. We killed him. That's not so happy or energetic or positive feeling. And as the good news was preached, we see that it, it really didn't come across very positively. Very first gospel sermon, Acts chapter 2, and I know we're studying this right now, but just to, to add and to cut a little bit from Peter's sermon there in the middle of Peter's sermon, men of Israel hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with his mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. And at the end of that sermon, he again tells them, of Jesus the Christ who you killed. Good news! You killed the one who would save you. The next sermon in chapter 3 of Acts and, and this is the one that we, we finished up this morning uh, in class. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers who glorified, or glorified His servant Jesus whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. You killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. And to this we are witnesses. You killed him, I saw. You killed him, of that we 
are witnesses. The same thing is said in Stephen's, and Stephen dies for making this speech. It's slightly different. But at the end of his sermon, he points out that their ancestors killed all the prophets that came and spoke to them. And you're no different. You killed the prophet, the Son of God, who came and spoke to you. They killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one. And you now, whom you now have betrayed and murdered. The good news of Jesus. Jesus came to earth to be the sacrifice. Good news. You killed him so that he was. Jesus came to earth to be your Messiah, your righteous one, chosen of God, the author of life, and you killed him. Congratulations. But that's exactly what we needed to happen. When relating the gospel back to the Corinthian congregation again, we read in chapter 15, verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried and was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. He laid down His life for our sins. And so, while Peter is preaching in Acts chapters well, all of the early portions of Acts. While Stephen gives the, the sermon for which he gives his life and points out so many times to those Jewish authorities, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault. What we're told over here in Corinthians is that if you want to partake in that salvation, it's your fault too. That while you may not have driven the nail, while you may not have used the reed to beat him with while you may not have mocked him or spat upon him on the road you needed him to die just as much as everybody else did because without his death you have no hope of salvation because you are part of the human race you need salvation from sin and through Christ alone can we be made alive the good news is that a Savior came and died. The good news is that one suffered. But it doesn't stop there. It's what I get to do about it. I get to be saved. It's a pretty lengthy reading, but in Ephesians chapter 2, we'll start in verse 1. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, to spirit, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And by nature were children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Jesus in Christ Jesus for by grace you've been saved through faith and this is not of your own doing it's a gift of God not a result of works so that no one may boast why read so much of this from Ephesians he points out at the beginning of the chapter there that you once was lost in sin, but Jesus took you in to use a song. That because you are of mankind, you've got sin that you need to deal with, and the only way for that to happen was for Jesus to die for your souls. So good news. While it is that Jesus died for you, it's that you get to live. It's that you get offered salvation. The good news is not that the bill is so expensive. The good news is that the bill is paid. The good news is not that you are lost in sin. The good news is that you can be saved. All sin, and the only way to be saved from, uh, from that sin is Jesus Himself. Jesus died for the unrighteous. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that He might bring us to God, having put to death in the flesh, 
being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. That's the good news. That while Jesus suffered, we have the opportunity to be saved. What does gospel mean? It means good tidings. It's good information that is being related. The best news that there ever has been is that you have a Savior who died for your soul. Jerry. Thank you. We talked about uh, in Bible class this morning about relating that information, how in Acts chapter 4, the the leaders of the temple, the, the Jewish leaders were like, look, you can, you can be a good Christian. You can live your good Christian life. You can do your good Christian activities. Just don't tell anybody about Jesus. Just don't tell anybody about Jesus. And as we related, sadly, too many people have taken that, fa- that tact that we, we, we're good people. We're very religious. We do, we do all kinds of things in our private and wonderful life. But if we're not telling anybody about the good news of Jesus, then we're doing exactly what the Jews told the Christians to do in the first century. Just shut up. Be a good Christian, but shut up. The good news doesn't. The good news is related. It's tidings that get pushed. It's someone else that gets told, I've got a Savior who died for me, and you do too. So I have a trick. It's terrific. You'll love it. The next time you hear someone say good news, just look me in the eye and say, Jesus. It doesn't even matter what the context is. You want to hear the good news? Jesus? Love it. This is... I. I Associated with a lot of people at one point that love to do the well. I got good news. I got bad news, and that just makes me want to listen closely to them. Good news is Jesus. Do you want to hear the good news? The next time you hear the words "good news," just say Jesus. It is the best news there ever has been. Find a way to tell someone else about it. I dare you. The priests, the, the, those who would oppose God, those who would be against the power of Christ for salvation would love nothing more for you to just lead your good little Christian life and shut up. Can you tell someone the good news instead? Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that He might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. And the reason that that's good news is that there will be a time when all will pay. That's the exact context that's being used. And while there's a a sidestep in the next verse, the one after it picks up talking about the wrath of God. Do you remember that at one time there was a pouring out of the wrath of God on the wicked? In Genesis chapters 6 through like 9, with the event with Noah and the flood, God looks at the world and He sees that the thoughts of mankind are wicked all the time. They are continually dwelling on evil things. And God's going to put an end to that evil. But He finds Noah to be righteous. And He says, this is what I need you to do. And you can be saved. And while none of us are righteous apart from Christ, because of Christ, because of the sacrifice of Jesus, because of His good news, you can be saved while God looks at the rest of the world. And and at one day, He's going to. One day we will all stand before the throne, the unrighteous and the righteous, and there's been a way made for everyone to avoid the wrath to come. Just like He showed the people of Noah today. He's going to show everyone at one time. Can you be saved like Noah? We're told that Noah was saved and that God was patient while Noah built an ark. The ark, the way that God prescribed for Noah to be saved. Noah was saved because he accepted what God told him and built the ark. And verse 21 says baptism does that for you. You don't have to build an ark, thankfully. You don't have to build an ark. Also, thankfully, I don't have to live over 120 years. Just a private thing. I'm good with it. I don't have to build an ark. 
But if I want to be saved from the wrath to come, like Noah was saved from the wrath to come, I do have to be baptized. I do have to enter into relationship with Jesus Christ. I do have to accept that good news and put Him on in baptism. Jesus came to be the good news. The good news. You don't have to go to hell. Good news. You don't have to pay for your sins. Good news. Jesus already did. We're going to end with Romans chapter 15, starting in verse 8. I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. Hold on right there, because that's what we're going to read about. What's the reaction to good news? Congratulations. Paid off your home, your car, all of your student loans, your screen clear. What do you think? Cool. Congratulations, I've set up a trust fund so that neither you or your grandchildren or any descendant of yours that you will ever know will ever have any financial troubles whatsoever. What do you say? I guess that's okay. All you got to do is buy me about 100 acres in the middle of nowhere and tell me that there's good deer stock there and I'd be really happy with that. Jesus paid off the greatest debt that we could never pay off. Given lifetime after lifetime after lifetime of living as good as we could possibly live, Jesus paid all of it off. The reaction is supposed to be joy. If the reaction's not joy, then perhaps you don't have a terrific understanding of just how great His sacrifice was. We're told here in Romans, and what we're fixing to read, the reason, the result of accepting salvation, the result of receiving good news, and I'm going to go ahead and argue, you're not able to in turn give good news. Drew, I got good news. Does it really feel like I'm going to give you something positive? If you don't have the joy of having that debt paid off, how are you going to give it? The result is that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy as it is written. Therefore, I will praise your name among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with His people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol Him. And Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles in him, Will the Gentiles hope? May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. May the God of hope, the one who brought about salvation that sent His Son, so that we could kill Him, so that He could die for me, May the God who authored that hope fill you with joy and peace in, in believing. It's because of your reaction to receiving the good news. Because you've reacted to receiving the good news, be filled with joy and peace so that the power of the Holy Spirit may abound in hope. What I said just a moment ago, how do, you, how do you convey joy? How do you convey good news without joy? It's not going to look like good news. That's the prayer that's offered here at the end. Whenever it talks about in, in Romans 15 about these people being saved, Gentiles not born of Jewish lineage, all, all of us I would argue are, are Gentiles. <laughs> You've got to have the joy of Jesus Christ in your soul to in turn give it to someone else. If you hear good news and you do turn and say, Jesus, even if somebody just looks at you with a weird look and moves on, you have reminded at least two people that there is good news and it comes through Jesus. The person who heard you and you. 
sometimes we got to be reminded of that ourselves. The reaction to salvation should be joy. By the blood of Jesus, I'm going to heaven. Hallelujah. By the blood of Jesus, I get to go to heaven. Good news. A Savior died so that you can be saved. There is no better news. And there's no other way to be saved. If you are ready to be saved this morning and you have not, all things are ready is what we're going to sing. It is an invitation for you to respond to that. If you need your joy restored, if you need your brothers to pray for you so that you can in turn give the good news of Jesus' salvation to someone else, make it known as we stand and sing.